Hi, Patricia. How are you, John? I'm good. How are you doing? Doing great. It's great uh, talking to you. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I'm very excited about uh, this conversation. It's definitely going to be a treat for my audience and for myself to, oh, to good. Talk, talk to you about heaven, you know? Yeah. <laughs> we, we all love that. So very Absolutely. welcome. I just want to welcome you to God's Size Stories. So you're... Yeah, I'm, I'm excited. <laughs> yeah, very excited about writing about your book and also just getting to know a little bit about you and your work because uh, of course you became famous with, <laughs> with worldwide and really with your best-selling book imagine heaven and uh in yeah. 2015 you sold over a million copies that is incredible it is it is crazy it is yeah. only it's a god thing for sure <laughs> yes we actually we got that book uh, as a gift um steve's uh, my husband's um brother he passed away on a plane crash and oh, yes and it was a sudden so death very hard you know in the entire family but we we got your book as a gift uh, uh. at that time and it was a blessing for the family for sure Oh, that's awesome. I'm so glad. Where well, where where are you from originally? I am originally from Brazil. Uh, Brazil? So, yes. <laughs> really? I've got lots of friends in Brazil. I play really? soccer. I play futsal with Brazilians every Saturday. No way. Yeah. My wife and I were there uh, in Fortaleza and Rio and Porto Alegre. Huh? Okay, so you went yeah, from my daughter's way. best. My daughter's two best friends are Brazilians. <laughs> that is so cool. That's yeah. awesome. Well, uh, so you went from the northeast to the southeast, all the way to the deep south of Brazil. If you went to Porto Alegre, you went like almost at the end. I was oh yeah, in, that is. I'm Churrasco actually from, country. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I I'm actually from Santa Catarina, which is one state up from where Porto Alegre is. It's a small okay. state in the south. So yeah. I'm I, I'm from I'm I am a true southern. <laughs> well, I realized I realized that when I was there that it is kind of like the the south of the United States. Like Porto Alegre is kind of like Texas. Like they have the cowboys and the. <laughs> Chuhasku beef and <laughs> oh yes we have everything we have the rodeos and you know the south has a lot of that from sao paulo down uh, it's yeah. a big culture you know because it, that's where all the cattle comes from and all the, the right cool stuff oh, this is neat so and you are from austin yes that's that's in uh and you, and you lead a very large church it's uh a gateway church is a multi-site church mm -hmm. based in austin texas and you have you're also an international speaker have been to over 30 countries is that right yeah. and and of course your, your topics are leadership spiritual growth but i have a feeling that your favorite topic is heaven am i right it is i mean that's, <laughs> that's what i'm mainly speaking on now yeah so that's awesome well i today we are actually going to talk to John Burke about his brand new book, which is an incredible, incredible new work. And it's about heaven. It's called Imagine the God of Heaven Near Death Experiences, God's Revelation and the Love You've Always Wanted. It's coming up in November of 2023. Very you're it it is a inspiring book again. And of course, you have like over the last of the last three decades, you have studied commonality of over like a thousand N NDEs, right? Near death experiences yes. around the world. And so yeah. tell, tell us how long have you been investigating North Death, near death yeah, experience? I mean, you know, Patricia, for me, it goes back to before when I was just, I was, a, I was an engineer before I became a, a pastor. Um, and I was, I was always real skeptical. So I, I was an agnostic. I thought, I don't know if there's a God. And I thought Jesus is probably just a legend. And my dad was dying of cancer and someone gave him the very first research on near-death experiences. 
you know, and if you don't know what that is, when someone's heart stops beating, their brain waves cease, they're clinically dead, sometimes for minutes, sometimes for hours. And yet modern medicine or could be miracle, I don't know, brings them back. And they talk about a life to come that is more real than this life. And um, and many of them meet this God of light and, and love. Some of them met, said they met Jesus. And I read this in one night and I said, oh my gosh, like, could this actually be evidence that this is real, that there really is a God and there really is a life to come? And so it opened me up and I started exploring and I, I did come uh, to faith in, in Jesus and, uh, and became a pastor. But for the last, I, I, for the last 35 years, I have just had this insatiable curiosity to understand how do what these people say fit with, with what the Bible has been saying all along. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I wrote, imagine heaven, I was showing that all these commonalities uh, of, of what people report is, is the expectation. Now, not necessarily our expectation, because a lot of people have a really bad expectation. Yes. <laughs> they don't have a good imagination. And so I was trying to show, no, you know, what, what these people are, are saying is that um, the life to come is the real thing. This is the shadow. And that's commonly what they what they say, and um, and by the way, these aren't uh, these are common. So the Gallup poll found um, when they did a survey that one out of twenty five Americans that's millions of Americans have had a near death experience. It's crazy. And um, you know, in Imagine the God of Heaven, my new book, I I, I chapter two is is um, science skeptics and NDEs. And I show how there are these 10 points of evidence that convinced me, and really for anybody to have a, a legitimate alternate explanation of what these are, they've got to make sense of these 10 points of evidence. Mm -hmm. um, so they are reporting something that I've come to believe is, is real. You know, a principle of science is what is consistently observed is real. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the fundamental principle of science. Yes. So when you are observing people, thousands of people, millions of people all over the globe, and I have over I have over 70 stories in Imagine the God of Heaven from every continent, mm -hmm. and yet when they encounter God, they're describing the same being, yes. the same God of light, the same God of love, this God who knows them intimately, personally, like more personally than a spouse ever could. And loves them with a love that they they say um, is beyond love of a parent for a child, is beyond love of a spouse for a spouse, beyond that of a friend to a friend who knows each other well, and um, and they never want to leave. Yes. And and so what, what I'm too. yeah. So what what I'm trying to do in in this new book and imagine the God of Heaven is is show first of all part one is global evidence of this God of all nations. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing because there's stories. I, I tell stories from all over the world. Mm -hmm. uh, Santosh, who, who was a manufacturing engineer who grew up in India, Bibi, who uh, was in Tehran. Um, and, and when she dies, this almighty God appears and says, I am he who is. Wow. Well, that's exactly what God said to Moses. Yes. <laughs> uh, she she told me this in Farsi. So it was being translated into English from Farsi. But she said, I am he who is. Wow. And she starts exploring Great Santosh. Um, Santosh is taken by this God of light and love when he his pancreas um, ruptures and he hears code blue, code blue. And he's up above his body looking at you know them scrambling. And then this brilliant light comes and again he says brighter than the sun mm -hmm. but he knew it was a divine light and and he knew it had supreme authority and he had to obey it but he fell in love with this light he said because he knew this light is for me and so he follows he did not really have a choice but he follows this light and they go and they come to this place that 
he's the the light then is 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 shining in and over this whole place that he describes as a giant compound. Now, if you've ever been to India, which I've been several times, there are these there are compounds everywhere, kind of walled gated communities, right? So I didn't understand exactly when he's telling me this what he's describing, but then he says it was it was huge. So another commonality of near death experiencers is that th their sight is magnified; they can see telescopically thousands and thousands of miles and every detail which which sounds kind of bizarre but you know it's interesting I, I i point out that in the book of revelation john is taken in heaven to this very high mountain he said it was a very high mountain and he's looking out over the city the city of god but he can read the names on the gates mm -hmm. how well, this telescopic vision that the yes, Indians yes. talk about all the time. Well, Santosh is describing the same city that John described in Revelation 21, but he doesn't even know it when he's describing it. So he said there are these high walls and it's in the shape of a square, but these are beautiful walls and inside just these gorgeous grounds and mansions and 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 buildings, but of another worldly material. And he said there were 12 gates and I realized that there were angels outside all the gates. And he said, I, I longed to enter in because I felt like that's where I belonged. That's mm -hmm. where all humanity belongs. And anyway, long story short, Santosh ends up, he, he also sees a vision of this, this hellish place. And then he sees a vision of God Almighty on his throne. And he has a life review. This is another commonality. And, you know, he sees all is good and all is bad. And he and he falls down and says, Lord, forgive me, Lord, forgive me, because he realizes, you know, we all we all mess up. We all fall short. Right. And he, he's afraid that, you know, this horrible place he saw this outer darkness is what he's where he's going to end up. And and then the Lord speaks to him and has incredible mercy and compassion in his voice. And it confuses. him. And he says, Santosh, I'm sending you back. When you go back, you must love your family and especially your daughter. She needs you right now. Now think about that. You know, th this is the God who is, he created us all for a relationship with himself. He knows us all. He knows everything about what we need too. You know, even though Santosh didn't know him at this point, he knew Santosh and he knew even his daughter and what his daughter needed. And so Santosh then sees a very, he says, a very narrow gate right next to him that's open to him into the kingdom of heaven. And he says, Lord, when I come back, I want to go through that, that narrow gate, that narrow door. And the Lord says to him, what I want, he said, he, he said, what I want is relationship, honesty. I want to see how honest you can be with me, not one day a week. 365 days a year, walk with me, he said. Santosh ends up coming back and he's confused. He's like, who was this God of mercy and, and, and grace and love? He was not like the gods I know of. And he kept praying and saying, God, who are you? Who were you? Two years later, his daughter is invited to sing in a choir and Santosh goes and the, the pastor is giving a message on how Jesus is the gate through which we must enter the kingdom of heaven and about the narrow door. And Santosh starts reading the Bible and realizes what I experienced is this. Wow. And, and these kinds of stories are all over, all over the globe. Yeah. Like I said, Bibi, uh, I, I tell of Swedeek who is in Rwanda in, in, in Africa. Um, all, you know, every, every continent and mm -hmm. they're meeting the same God of, of light and love. Uh, and what I'm, what I'm showing is he is the God of all nations and he always has been. Yes. That's incredible. Well, you know, one of the things that you, you encounter when you start talking about near death experiences, that is people who are going to say, how do you know that these people are in making up this near death stories right so, so right. some some and some folks also believe that this is just a 
simply an activity of the dying brain, right? That's also something that exactly. scientists try to explain it that way. Well, how would you respond to that? Yeah, so I, it, chapter two of this new book, Imagine the God of Heaven, um, I talk about science skeptics and NDEs, and I there have been about 30 alternate explanations where people go, oh, well, that's just like DMT or ayahuasca, or that's like fighter pilot syndrome. And so I, I didn't have time to go into every alternate explanation. So what I showed instead are the 10 points of evidence that it not only convinced me as a skeptical engineer, but convinced many skeptical doctors, cardiologists, oncologists who interviewed their patients. And um, just to give you a few of them, verifiable observation. So like I said, when people first leave their, their body, they have a spiritual body mm -hmm. and they feel themselves more alive than they've ever felt. Uh, not just five senses, you know, a hundred senses, they say, but they can also observe what's going on in the room with their resuscitation. Yes. And there have been many studies done. What people don't understand, there have been 900 scholarly articles written about the scientific aspect of near-death experiences, published in the journal of the American Medical Association, The Lancet, Europe's most prestigious medical journal. I mean, this has been well studied. So one study showed that um, of the observations that near-death experiencers make when they're out of their body but observing the resuscitation, 90, uh, 92% were completely accurate. So each one may make 10 observations, completely accurate. Another, another 6% were mostly accurate with maybe a few details not lining up. Only, only one person in the study, which made up 2%, was completely inaccurate. Wow. And that's compared to a control group mm -hmm. that they were, they were basically just saying what they'd seen on ER. <laughs> right. So what you're saying is that there is no way that people from all over the world, different backgrounds, different cultures, they experience some, they have some commonalities in this near death experience that uh, just make it become fact and science, in other words, even. Well, yeah. I mean, how do you explain when blind people, so I, I have two or three blind people in this new book as well, when they die, clinically, they can see and they report all the same things. It's the wow. same God. So that's another point of evidence. Another point of evidence um, is the commonalities. You know, there are about 40 commonalities, but they don't all experience all the same commonalities. Right. Well, if it's just something happened in the brain, they probably should experience all, all the same commonalities. It's just a human brain thing, but that's not what's happening. Mm -hmm. uh, the, another point of evidence is how do you explain people from completely different religious backgrounds? Mm -hmm. In some cases, people who are agnostic, um, and yet when they die, they experience this same God of light and love um, who is personal, uh, who, who, like I said, knows them better than they know themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's not the God necessarily they were expecting. And what I'm and, and I'm showing in Imagine the God of Heaven that, you know, this God hasn't just revealed himself in our age of modern medicine and near-death experiences. Mm -hmm. I'm showing how it, it fits who this God has been revealing himself to be all along and has given proof in in history as well. Well, and that that's that brings me to another question. With the different religions, like people from different religions that have, you know, don't know about Jesus uh, as the way to heaven. How, how does that, what is the difference? And how, how do, do this near death experience, how, how has this impacted from what you, from what you saw their lives as people who are not believers necessarily? And are the yeah. experiences of heaven different or the visions that they have after death different from those who are believers yeah and this is a part that i think has has confused um people especially christians um and and honestly me for about 30 years i i i was wrestling with this like how does it fit 
-hmm. And there were some interpretive keys that I found. So one is that realizing these near-death experiences are not full crossing over into eternity. They're not. Um, and a couple of points of evidence I talk about, there are many of them, 30%, come to what they say is a border or a boundary in this experience. They knew they couldn't cross over and still come back to earth. And in some cases, God tells them, you haven't died yet, you have to go back. And yet they, their heart wasn't beating, they had no brain waves. So whatever this is, it is not, it's not eternity. And, and that's important because someone may have a hellish experience or a heavenly experience and, and, or both. In some cases they get a, they get kind of a, a picture of both um, and meet God and feel this incredible love from God. But that doesn't mean that they necessarily know him or follow him. And it doesn't, it doesn't indicate what their eternity is going to be. And I think that's what confuses people. I like to give an analogy, like, I could visit Buckingham Palace, right? But that doesn't mean the king and queen are ready to adopt me into their family and let me move in forever. Right. And I think that's what's going on with these. I think what these are is God is giving testimony to the reality of the afterlife and who he is and, and how, you know, all the way from, from Genesis chapter 12, it says that he created... Uh, out of two people, Abraham and Sarah, a, a nation, the nation of Israel. I see your flag back yes. behind there. <laughs> my my background, my is it my dad's side? Yes. Well, he he created this nation, and and he said in 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 Genesis twelve, I will bless you to be a blessing to all the nations. So from the very beginning, God's plan has been to bless all the nations. And he did that by revealing himself through the prophets and ultimately through Jesus. And, and what I believe he's doing with these uh, encounters, these testimonies from all around the world, is he's just showing that. He's still the God of all nations. He created every person from every nation to be his child. And, and what he's done for us through Jesus is make a way that anybody whose heart turns back to him can be made right with him. Absolutely. The Absolutely. only thing that can keep us away from God is our own pride, our own willful, no, I don't, I'm good. I don't need God. You know, I'll be my own God. Yes. I'm good. Right. I'm I'm good as is. As is. And, you know, in the book, and, and, and the book is called Imagine God, right? Imagine Heaven. So uh, you, you say this on, in your book, you say how you and I imagine God matters because it influences us for better or worse more than anything else we can think about. It shapes how we view ourselves, others, and our very purpose for existing. And you say that NDEs are God's gift to our globally connected world. I think how so. so. How so? Well, just think about it. Never in history until now could we hear from these people all over the globe, right? Um, I mean, I, I you know, right right now uh, there's a, a pre-order for the book, and and with it you get an audio book, but you also get a video of some of these people I interviewed. You can see them from from Rwanda, you know, a guy who who grew up. Muslim in Rwanda with Hutu and Tutsi parents and has this incredible story, a, wow. a, a woman from Tehran, this, this guy from several people from India, um, from Australia, from the United States, from Canada. And, and yet they are, they're describing the same, the same God. Now, an important thing to realize is many come back and they seek God. And when they seek him with all their heart, they find him. Some don't which is very confusing to me. Yeah. But again, it shows you the power of human ego and pride too. God does not, and I write about that. You know, I, I, I show that really the Bible is this grand love story from beginning to end. And when you start to understand that story, that we were created for a relationship with God and each other, you know, that's mm -hmm. that's what God told Moses. It's what he told, you know, what Jesus said, to love God and to love one another. That sums up all the commands. 
right? Yes. That's right. Indie ears say the same thing. God is love, but a love of another magnitude. But what he what matters most to him, you know, when they get a life review, they see how we treat one another ripples through humanity mm -hmm. and it matters to God. Um, and, 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 and so you're, you're seeing this, uh, told again and again through these people, but, but here's the other thing. And the reason I wrote, imagine the God of heaven is because we put God in a box. We can't help it. And we need right. to stretch our imaginations. So, so God is, far greater than we can possibly imagine, but he's also far more relatable. I, I think about um, this one girl, 16-year-old Jewish girl, grew up with a father uh, who was actually very abusive. Her name's Heidi. Um, she's become a, a close friend of mine. But um, her dad had a mantra. Every day she heard it, there is no God. Your life is no more. Is not worth any more than a speck of dust. Jesus is the biggest hoax ever perpetrated on mankind. But but Heidi believed in God and she prayed to God every night from when she was a little girl. And, and he, she went through a very abusive, so you can imagine, right? So every night she felt like God was there giving her peace, tucking her in, putting her to sleep. When she's 16, her horse falls on her and crushes her. She has a, an accident. She shoots up. She's 30 feet above her, her body, looking down on the accident. She knows she's dead. And she sees this light over her shoulder and turns and looks. And there, floating with her 30 feet up, is this brilliant man of light. And she knows who he is. He's Jesus. And she knows that. And she says he has this big grin on, her, on his face. And she says, I know you. And it was like this great reunion and she she said he he showed her her life review and in it he showed her that when she was praying going to sleep at night he was sitting there beside her mm -hmm. now that may confuse people because it's like well but she 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 didn't know jesus no she didn't but he is god yeah and that's what he's been showing all along and she did love god and she sought god with all her heart and because of what he did through Jesus, of course, the 16-year-old girl, you know, he he loves her. So what's crazy is we don't realize how relatable God is. Right. So he yeah. said, he said he, you know, they laughed at things in her life review, like when she was a little kid in, in a crib and her mom set this other little kid down with her and the little kid whacked her on the nose with a rattle. And, and she said, you know, it didn't hurt me. I was just mad. And Jesus and I just laughed like crazy watching that as, you know, she's a 16 year old girl. Then Jesus takes her hand and he says, watch this. And they take off flying, just like going so fast. Now, this is a 16 year old girl that loved the speed of a horseback, of riding horseback, right? She said, I look over at Jesus and, and it's like we were surfing this wave of light and he's grinning from ear to ear and I'm just grinning from ear to ear. And she said, it was the funnest thing we've ever done. And he takes her to God, the father. And then she never wanted to leave his presence, never wanted to leave his presence. She sees the beauty of heaven. I describe all that in there. And then when he brings her back, he says, you have to go back. And she's like, I'm not going back. No way. This is where I belong. I don't want to leave you. Right. And when he, when he puts her back in her body, she realizes that he left. Jesus left, but his presence stayed with her. And she later, later realized as, as she saw God and she's, you know, she, she realized this is Jesus who took her to the father who left her the presence of the Holy Spirit. And, and I show several young girls who would not have known anything about describing God that way, who had this near-death experience and described the mystery of God as one, and yet also Father, Son, and Spirit. Mm -hmm. So it's Incredible. like, so it's, it's like, amazing. It's, like it's like the amazing. mysteries, the mysteries uh, that uh, we, we don't know are revealed when we get to that you know, that level of eternity, some things that don't, 
that we don't understand even because evidently for people who have never heard of this God of the Bible or, or don't know the God of the Bible, to have that kind of understanding has to be supernatural and uh, you know yeah. divine for sure. There is not another explanation to that for sure. And like I said, a very important thing is realizing like Heidi came back and she she believed in Jesus and started you know at what well at first honestly she was afraid because um mm -hmm. she knew how anathema jesus was but in her heart of hearts she always knew and she always always mm -hmm. believed mm -hmm. i was actually i was on um a, a new york news show she saw me reached out to me and said that happened to me when i died and i was with jesus but i've never told anyone that and so we started conversing and wow. i actually started you know, she grew up Jewish. So I started to show her Isaiah and all the Old Testament prophets, which I, I put in Imagine the God of Heaven, showing proof of who the Messiah would be. Wow. And, you know, and 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 so it, it was it was really cool for her to make the connection to her Jewish roots as well. That is very, very cool. Well, you know, I have uh, two situations in my family, two, two uh, near-death experiences in my family. One is my dad, when, about 30 years ago, during mm. a surgery, they lost him. And he, he says that this, he left his body, he could see everything that was going on in the room. And he said he saw this bright light behind him. And uh, this, you know, Jesus, it would be Jesus put his hands on his shoulders and brought him back down you mm -hmm. know it was a very short experience but it it was like very very strong for him oh yeah yeah so i mean I it's imagine. yeah yeah and he talks about that and his faith was renewed when whenever that happened after that happened for sure he was already a believer but it was just it just ignited his his love for god he experienced yeah. that love that you describe you know that that's something that's common that everybody can feel that that love and the incredible light. I think that those are two things that everybody uh, explains that there's like a, a love that you can't quite uh, explain, you know, yeah. in words. And then there's this light that is not like anything that you've ever seen. Uh, I've interviewed Lee Strobel and he talks about colors that you've never seen as well. They're like yeah. there's, you know, yeah, uh, Lee's a good friend. Yeah, yeah. I interviewed him for uh, the is is heaven real? I think is it that the right? Um, one of his, his lately his latest book is about yeah, heaven too. Yeah, yes. but yeah, uh, yeah, I'm I'm the expert on NDEs in his in his book on that's this. right. <laughs> that's right. He he yeah. cites you there for sure. So, yeah. but yeah, it's it's incredible. Now, um, let me ask you this. Uh, you know, you you, you mentioned something that a lot of people they see God as this like very solemn and serious, you know, and and you write in the book about it. Just give an example about the laughter and the joy, and even like the play from the playfulness of God. You know that that these people. Yeah. Say. Um, how is that? Uh, and you know, I that's one of the things that I love the most about the show, The Chosen, is how they portray Jesus like that, just laughing and dancing and having. Because I imagine him to be, you know, the most joyful man that's ever lived. So I, I know. So, but so, but that's hard. That's hard for people to imagine. Right. So and so, yeah. yeah. Well, and that's so. So the the last section of the book is doing life with this God of joy and, and laughter. And I'm talking about, I'm talking about prayer and how prayer works in heaven, but I'm also talking about, I'm showing that, you know, all these people who in his presence, like Greg Rickard, who's this, this home builder who reached out to me, um, built tie in custom homes. And, and, and when he's there with Jesus and he's getting this life review and he talked about how, as we were watching my, my life replay, he said there were there were points at which Jesus and I both were just laughing. He said he wasn't laughing at me. We were laughing. He was laughing with me at some of the funny things that happened in my life. And he said, I realized, you know, that there is no better friend that I have. There's no one else who has been with me through it all. That's and he true. has, mm -hmm. you know, that, that's that's one of the things we have to realize is that even if we don't believe in him, you know, it says in the scriptures, in him, we live and move and have our being, all of us. Absolutely. He's the creator and the sustainer of all life. So mm -hmm. he's there with you, whether you acknowledge him or not. 
And what I think this book helps people see is there is no reason not to acknowledge him and be honest. He enjoys enjoying life with you. Just like, you know, I have two little granddaughters mm -hmm. and I love enjoying life with them. Absolutely. I love it, you know? Mm -hmm. And and when you see, so for instance, um, Jim Woodford is another person that I, that I interview um, in Imagine the God of Heaven. He was a commercial airline pilot. Now he, interestingly, was an agnostic his whole life, but his, his wife was praying for him. She believed in Jesus, followed Jesus, praying for him. He just, he was extremely wealthy, um, did really well, had a yacht, a horse farm, 19 British sports cars, his own wow. airplane. <laughs> He flew, commercial pilot, flew all over the world, has many businesses. He gets Gian Barre, um, ends up overdosing on opioids, and he dies sitting in his truck. And as he's dying, he realizes he's dying, watching the setting sun. And he said, I realized it. And in that last moment, I had an aha. And I find God gives people these. Last chances, right? I joke with Jim. I think you beat the thief on the cross. As far as <laughs> last second crying out. Yeah. Because literally he 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 heard, thank God for the life you thought was your making, but was his. Ask his forgiveness. And in that moment, as his head's hitting the steering wheel, he cried out, God, forgive me. So he leaves his body. He goes up through this, this tunnel. He comes to this place. I, I'm, I'm going to have to skip ahead. But another thing I find is that when people wait to the last minute, many times God lets them see where they were headed apart from him. So Jim does see that and again cries out to God. And he he pulls him, he takes him out of this, this horrific place and into this, this place of exquisite beauty and he's walking with these angels. Now, what I wanted to say is, you know, in, in Psalm 37, 4, it says, delight yourself in the Lord. In other words, you know, put your hope, put your trust in him, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Trust in him and, and he will do it. He will make your, your dawn shine, your, your, your light shine like the dawn, right? Yep. So Jim, even though he had not lived for God, this shows you the heart of God, right? God still made him to be his child, and he delights. He's a good father, Jesus says, who wants to give us good gifts, right? Yeah. So Jim is walking along with these, with these angels, and he's seeing this beauty of paradise, of the mountains and the hills and the flowers and colors beyond expression. And, um, and then they, they come to the split rail fence, and the angel, uh, the angel says to him, look. And out from behind this, the, these trees gallop three beautiful Arabian horses. And as they gallop across this meadow, it was like light came out of from their from their hooves and they come up to him. And he realized that, you know, horses were his love on earth. And it was like God was showing him, look, I, I've had these things for you all along. This is. I delight in giving you the desires of your heart. Randy Kay, who is a CEO who, who dies, he sees Casey, his dog that he grew up with. It was like his best friend. Karina mm -hmm. from Columbia, same thing. She sees her two dogs. You know, God, mm -hmm. God delights. And Jim, Jim was a commercial airline pilot. The, the, the angel says, touch my robe. And, and then he shoots up and he is up looking down on the same city of God that Santosh described. Wow. describing the same city, but from an aerial view, like if you were flying into a city as a commercial airline pilot. <laughs> now, yeah. here's what's cool. I, I interviewed another airline captain, Captain Dale Black. God gave him the same aerial flyover of the Revelation 21 city of God. They That's all three, incredible. Santosh, Jim, Captain Dale Black, they all describe it the same. That's incredible. But isn't that like God? He he knows yeah. what we love. He yeah. knows mm -hmm. what we enjoy. And he's a good father who wants to give us good gifts, Jesus said. That's incredible. I, I love that the, the thought that, uh, you know, God uses the things that right here on earth we, we either loved and 
uh, and cherished and he he is preparing a better place for us that's gonna but but he's going to give us a joy that we've never experienced so evidently the things that gave us joy here they're going to be just heightened in heaven i truly believe that too so that's another yeah, answer, and- right i mean if you think about what you just described somebody that loves flying and you know it just gives me joy to think about my my brother-in-law who's in heaven and you know so i imagine that he also had a uh an image like that as he was you know going into heaven too because oh, he, but loved what I'm flying. Also- he loved seeing the world from, that god made from up from up there so yeah, and I, and what I what I hope people get from imagine the God of Heaven as well, is to realize that God enjoys enjoying life with us right now. Mm-hmm. You know, G, one of my favorite authors, C.S. Lewis, says joy is the serious business of heaven. Yes. You know, and and we so I think we fail to trust God because we think He wants to somehow take life away from us, and and yet you know, there's this beautiful passage in Habakkuk, Habakkuk three, and everything is going wrong. Mm -hmm. And, and I mean, it's, it's bad, bad. And, you know, Jesus didn't promise that things are going to go okay in this world. Um, He said, I have overcome the world, take heart in me, right? Mm -hmm. Um, There's another story in Imagine the God of Heaven of Randy, who was a CEO, and in Jesus' presence, he, he turns to Jesus, and Jesus has a vial, and he and he says to him, um, and and he they're they're by this stream, and and Randy had just scooped down and and drank from this this stream, this river, and he said it was like joy, just just ecstatic joy, just burst from within him, mm-hmm. like stuff way beyond anything Earth could produce, and 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 Jesus has this big smile, and then he turns and and he sees him with a vial, and he says, "What's that?" And Jesus said, "I've been collecting your tears, beloved." And Randy had been bullied. He had had asthma as a kid. He'd, he'd gone through a lot of hardship. And he realized that, you know, I mean, that's in a psalm. Yeah. That's a psalm. Yes. That, that he under he knows all our sorrows. He collects mm-hmm. all our tears. But what Jesus did is he took the vial and he poured it into what I think was the river of life. Wow. You know, it's what Jesus said in, in, in John 7 when he when he said, come to me, all you who are thirsty now to your innermost being will for, flow rivers of living water. Mm-hmm. And it says that he was talking about the spirit of God. But I think he's what we experience now is a taste of what Absolutely. is to come. Absolutely. But we can begin to, you know, walk with God and experience it. And I think all these what all these stories show is what the scriptures say. You know, God, he doesn't necessarily rescue us from all these horrific things in life. And I have a whole chapter on the perfect plans of God and the confusing parts of it and, and how what people see in his presence helps. It helps make sense that what he's saying is true, even though it doesn't feel good still. Mm -hmm. Right. Wonderful. Yeah. But he is in it with us and he is going to pour, he's going to, that's what Randy realized. He's taking all my sorrows and he's trading them for joy. Oh, I love that. I love that. What a what a blessing to just think about what the life that's out, that is to come for us. And I know, um, unfortunately, I, I, I could talk to you all day about heaven. <laughs> <laughs> but, but John, we, I, I would like for you to just talk to someone out there who is either, you know, maybe uh, they or a loved one have been given a death sentence. You know, they have a... a um, terminal disease and uh, I just have a friend of mine who is going through right now the, the end of her life and mm-hmm. she she sees that and and uh, or someone who has lost someone who they love so much and they, they they are believer they know that they are in heaven just encourage them with about this book you know how how this book is going to encourage them to see to see the life to come as something to look forward to yeah yeah, and you're gonna and you're gonna realize that as hard as it is to understand, even mothers with young children who loved their children dearly did not want to come back. And they and they say, not because I didn't love my my children, I love them more than anything, but they realize that it's all going to work out. It's all okay. Mm-hmm. 
Like God really does have a plan and he really is working it out. And as we trust him through this life, this is just the beginning of the real story, the real story of life. And, and they are tasting that already and cheering you on. And it's not going to be a second in their time before we're all together again in the presence of God, living life, just like we're living it here, yeah. but, but on, you know, turbocharged yeah steroids yeah seriously <laughs> steroids of joy <laughs> and yeah. love that's wonderful oh i love that john thank you so much this was a very inspiring conversation and i just uh just pray that this book is going to help a lot of people understand heaven in, from a different light and god speak to you and everything that you do in your ministry god bless you so much and thank you for this time no, thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate it. You're very welcome.